uh, some considerations pertaining to the fate of uh, liberalism, economic or uh, scientific. Um, so we'll use the uh, road of entry of um, uh, not an attempt really to decompose, but just to uh, bounce off this uh, uh, provocations of Samuel Moyne in his um, uh, article, which I think came out online just yesterday, um, with some um, written remarks that I made in advance and some um, extemporaneous uh, comments. Uh, the article is entitled, Can Liberalism Save Itself? Um, and it's put down as a guest essay. Um, so this question of liberalism is taken up in the article mainly um, as a juxtaposition of uh, the pre-Cold War attitude, Roosevelt era attitude, or so far as I can understand it, as the Roosevelt attitude towards liberalism and then the um, slippery slope into this um, Judas Sklar um, liberalism of fear. There's an article um, that, one, that I'll point you to called um, Liberalism of Fear by Judas Sklar that came out in 1989, I think, so at the end of the so end of the Cold War, basically, in a certain sense. Of course, we have this sort of Cold War II um, going on, uh, with some hot war also in the Ukraine, uh, with the so-called proxy war. Um, so the the first paragraph of my prepared um, opposition to the article um, uh, begins. Cloth curtain or kicho, um, given in the interpretation, screen of state. So this is a um, translation of a um, Japanese term. Uh, provided a serious concealment in the firefly lit chambers of uh, the high end courts. So during the high end period, in the, uh, I don't know, around nine of what we'd say in terms of centuries. This notion of centuries, by the way, I think everything in terms of centuries has only come in after the French Revolution and it was invented, I think, um, by a Romanian or, or, or something, along, uh, somewhere, uh, a Slavic guy. Um, and it's very recent and it's very, it's uh, reminds of the word fact in the way it's so unavoidable. We just talk in terms of centuries. What else could you talk about? You could talk about high-end period. You could talk about um, Victorian period, the reign of a certain monarch. You could talk about the time of Vespasian or the um, uh, golden age of Rome with the good emperors. Um, but we talk all the time about centuries, so the high-end period is like 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, I believe. It's also the time when um, the Tales of Genji was written and there's uh, a scene where um, a court lady is standing behind one of these uh, screens, uh, these cloth curtains, uh, Kicho, and um, someone is speaking to her and then she walks away and uh, for he goes on for a long time speaking, not realizing that she was gone. Um, so this I make an analogy with the um, situation with the notion of the um, Republican form of government, which I think is the simplest a statement for modern liberalism, uh, a, a specific interpretation, Republican form of government pointing back to, so for instance, when, of course, the famous thing when Thomas Jefferson was asked whether we have, you know, a monarchy or a Republican form of government, Republican form of government, if you can keep it, madam. Um, but the basic meaning is a rational form of government where Socrates says a rational form of government is one that, um, uh, tries to improve the citizens. That's the basic point of a Republican form of government. Otherwise stated de facto, it means not a monarch, but a, um, 
uh, the, the bicameral um, legislative body. Um, so to go on, uh, Mr. Moyne substantially opposes uh, Patrick J. Deneen's verdict, which observes that liberalism is not able to offer normative prescriptions and for this reason substitutes extremes of state legal prosecutorial power which obviate Blackstone's ratio which once defended the innocent by insisting it is better to let um, 10 guilty free some say 20 uh, than to wrongly convict one. So uh, let me try to uh, comment on the details of what I'm saying here. Uh, so the point is liberalism is totally negative in the sense that the freedom to um, ethics or morals means you can't have something like Jewish law. So there's a debate in Israel, by the way, are the, the um, two more conservative groups of the Israelis think there should be Jewish law in Israel and everyone else constituting the great majority thinks there should be a kind of secular law, uh, which there is. Um, so that uh, Israel is really um, the product of cult, so-called cultural Zionism rather than religious Zionism. And it's, um, in that sense, a liberal state. Um, so that's an exact meaning of, of, of what liberal state means, that you can't have a positive injunction. These are the Jewish steps. These are the Jewish um, footsteps. This is how you do things. But uh, rather, uh, you have a law that says everybody can decide um, how they're going to do things themselves within certain limits. And so you don't have a positive injunction about the norms. Then the result is everybody's always freaked out all the time about um, violations because there's no uh, direct statement about them. So Deneen is saying this is kind of an intolerable situation. Then what happens is since the state has become um, powerful beyond anything that's ever been seen in human history, especially since the end of the war, um, the de facto situation is that the prosecutors have um, almost unlimited power relative to the ordinary citizen. Um, only So we have a statement from distant antiquity from the time of Salone uh, from the uh, Scythian philosopher who came to the Greek world, um, Anacarsis, who made this famous statement, the laws are um, spider webs that the uh, uh, poor get caught in and the rich uh, easily break through. Um, this is Ralph Nader's uh, view of Trump, by the way. Trump is, you, is able to amass the same amount of legal resources to defend himself as the prosecutors attacking him have, so then they're in where he's able to um, up until now stay out of jail mainly. Uh, whereas most people are, um, it's totally impossible to um, amass the same amount of uh, resources as the prosecutorial power has. So this is the sense in which I mean there's a kind of obviation of Blackstone's ratio in the sense that it just simply makes no sense to try to um, strive towards it. It's just a, it's a moot point. There's a total... Um, power in the favor of the prosecutors and and, and uh, there's endless number of people in jail that um, aren't guilty of the crimes that they're been accused of um, and then there's a meager relatively meager if, if uh, heroic attempts to uh, write that by all kinds of um, private organizations but they can't uh, this is always a um, retro retrograde uh, as it were, retrospective attempt to write things that the uh, liberal state by its logic has already um, and, con and perpetually um, constantly um, producing. 
Um, and then let me see what's the last part here. Okay, so that's that paragraph. And let's look the next paragraph also in some way responding to this very general um, article Wayne has uh, produced, which, however, he seems to have a um, kind of a specific point that he, he thinks that the so-called liberalism of fear, the scarred liberalism, the Cold War liberalism, should be, as it were, evacuated, and then we could go back to the old liberalism. Um, I think this is um, to totally overlook um, a problem which I, I, I try to get to with um, Zygmunt Bellman's um, liquid fear concept, which begins to touch on uh, the radical change of substance in the human being, which corresponds to uh, Marx, uh, Hegel, Marx, Heidegger, and um, the move from economic. So in, in Hegel, we have classical uh, lib uh, cla the end of um, classical philosophy in the interpret in the um, uh, radical refutation of Plato and Aristotle by interpreting being as becoming or being as the um, admixture of nothing and, and being um, and therefore there's no more eternity there's only the absolute moment of um, de facto history uh, so that's the end of philosophy in Hegel, and then you get, uh, since that was um, basically Hegel's metaphysics, in my opinion, is totally artificial, so of course it doesn't work, And um, but it was made necessary because of the problems raised by Hume and Kant to um, to think those problems through. So he thought through more thoroughly problems that hadn't been thought through, and that was the result. So it's not that Hegel made some mistake, but it's rather that he thought through things that hadn't been thought through, and that's what the um, result was, and then Nietzsche picks up on Hegel. But we also have another strain, right? We have the strain where the interpretation is economic, so um, Marx, Gramsci. So Gram in Gramsci, we see a specific interpretation of liberalism. So liberalism taken as Republican form of government, taken as this Platonic Aristotelian project, uh, means uh, trying to find a life worthy of a free person. What would a person do if they weren't, didn't have any um, arbitrary pressures as those of a tyrant uh, put on them, but they were only doing what was um, natural to a human being, let's say, or not natural, but according to the idea of the human being in eternity, which, of course, in Hegel ceases to exist because eternity doesn't exist in Hegel. Um, um, so then we have this economic interpretation of liberalism, which is now totally in power. Everything is interpreted by the state and propagandized in the schools in in our education, where everybody's compelled to more education than any being ever had in the, um, I always want a term greater than is somehow possible here, because it's in existence, unless we go to Hinduism or something where there's um, other existences prior to this one, not just, I mean, other Earths, other worlds. Um, for this Earth, um, there's never been so much forced ed education, you know, 20, 25 years of education for almost, for a large proportion of the population, at least, you know, 12 years of education, 12, 14 years of education for most people. Um, that's an incalculable um, uh, factor. That we, we simply can't understand what that means, that level of uh, brainwashing, and to put it in a negative way. Um, and then you get to Heidegger, where the question is scientific. So what's the ultimate scientific uh, view of the human being? It's science, which is um, nihilistic, because science can only tell you how to do things and not what thing is, is good or not. 
Uh, so I tried to move in this answer between the economic and the, the scientific uh, version of man, but I think these are the, at the core, what's driving things. There's kind of a slide between the constant um, propagandizing of economic, the economic factor, um, constantly speaking of marginality and elitism in terms of uh, salary in terms of um, uh, uh, economic position with a, a slight addition of the so-called cultural capital or some other similar term. Um, let's go on with the uh, statement. Susan Rice confirms the Fukuyamaist liberalism is a kicho screen of state um, behind which sometimes someone is standing and sometimes nobody is there. It treats the idea of a republican form of governance as an advertisement in competition with radical Islam and other ideologies, other things interpreted as ideologies. Radical Islam uh, for itself would not be an ideology. Ideology in its basic meaning is um, uh, predicated on the fact value distinction or on the current view of um, factum as the things made, things come into being, the subject of science and the uh, observing of how things happen uh, as against uh, values, as against the notion of um, the good, the true, and the beautiful, how what should be um, sought by the um, genuinely educated people. That Remember that notion in the um, politia. I think it's the correct pronunciation of the Plato's Republic in the Greek uh, politia or polity, um, where the guardians have this difference from the ordinary citizens of their general education as that they're guided by an idea of the kelon, which is um, a combination of the beautiful and the noble, um, and ultimately looking towards the good. Um, values then take the place of this um, special education, which we could call morality. Um, so that, so we can see that again. So let's state that again. Um, uh, in Deenan's version, there can be no public morality, right, in this sense. The schools are not allowed to um, educate people in the classical sense of a liberal education of the life worthy of a free person because they can't tell people it's a negative situation. They're not. They're supposed to evacuate the possibility of uh, giving what would otherwise be understood as religious law or philosophic law. They have to leave, evacuate that area, and only say um, how things do happen. But they can't say which things are beautiful or noble, uh, because then immediately there would, somebody would say, uh, "Oh, you think." Um, fighting some war is, is beautiful or noble, but it's not, and so on. Or you think this or that is beautiful or noble, but it's not. And so that's the clash in the um, society rather than in um, the state, which is, determines our education. Um, and has actually already determined what we are before we really properly enter society. So it's a strange, this split between society and um, uh, the state is is is, is also um, essential to the um, liberal thing, um, and, and and kind of corresponds to the notion of the um, social contract and so forth. Um, so of this uh, advertisement in competition with radical Islam, it doesn't treat the Republican form as a true aim. So sometimes there's nobody standing behind that, that screen, that Kicho screen. There's nobody that really believes um, the Fukuyamaist notion that this is the right aim of the state, but rather um, the true aim is a realist interest politics of which the Republican form is a means as a competing form of winning um, remember this this old phrase of winning the hearts and minds of the citizens, as was said during the um, 
the, the Bush's wars in um, Iraq. Uh, I think Biden, Biden with his war today and um, the so-called, um, yes, I know people say, oh, but Biden didn't actually fire the first shot, Putin did, and so on. But um, on the other hand, there's 800 U.S. military bases like all over the world, and U.S. has like 10 times the military budget of every other state, and Putin is just like a little guy in a, um, you know, in a, in a, in a like a, a country on the side of the earth somewhere, not in the center somehow, that's just trying to assert himself at all. Um, but in any case, I think Biden uh, uh, has continued this um, Kijo screen version where yeah, sometimes he's standing there and he's saying, yes, I really believe that we have to do this idealist um, spreading of democracy and so on. Sometimes he's not standing there and uh, the realist thing is, is actually happening. This is the best. It's the best in our... And the real reason from the realist point of view is it's totally in America's interest if, uh, for instance, only America ha and America's allies has nuclear weapons. That would be better for America. Um... That's why there's all this fuss about the treaty with Iran. Um, and it would be totally better if America had the so-called, um, not just the full spectrum superiority in the military sense, but also that every country were a um, formal treaty signator that would go along with whatever America said. That would be also better for, clearly that would be better for America's interests. But of course, uh, some countries uh, don't want to be uh, vassal states of, of Mr. Biden. Um, so then let's go on to the third uh, paragraph. Uh, Mr. Moyne sees Judas Sklar's liberalism of fear, but doesn't regard the essence of liberalism as it becomes visible in Zygmunt Boyman's liquid fear. Liberalism in essence, uh, so now this is where I go, try to take the economic side, which is really the most dominant form of interpretation of, of, of human life today. Uh, liberalism is, in essence, is the saleable thing, including the human being, with its set of fungible attributes, which reduces an atmosphere of constant precarious humanity at the most personal level, especially visible in the vast disparity of income of older women who have lost their looks. So, for instance, it's like... Um, I think statistically there's like a large proportion of older women are in uh, the category of uh, poverty according to the official um, definitions of poverty. And um, obviously this has something to do with the attribute of sexual attractiveness which um, uh, women uh, tend to lose at an earlier age than men. Um, and other such attributes, including probably, in many cases, uh, uh, some abil some physical abilities to um, carry out tasks related to um, uh, work, which are inclusive of projecting um, authority, inclusive uh, not not just labor, but inclusive of uh, positions of authority. Um, like, I, for instance, I think of just uh, off the cuff, I think in, in Israel, um, it's often young women are used, uh, in the military. There's a, um, for everyone except, the, um, the Orthodox Jews, there's, uh, compulsory, uh, military service. And then they often use young women as the, uh, training as the commanders. Um, but they don't use old women as the training of the, as the commanders. Um, but that's just a, a side uh, example. That's not an essential example. Because Moyne tracks uh, Althusser and Zizek, so I, I think Moyne takes a position which is, um, from a legal point of view, it's the same as the Althusser and the Zizek. Um, uh, strategy, which is to say things such as um, 
here's liberalism that has these principles such as the equality of all citizens, this inalienable equality, the things said in the um, founding document of America. But then, of course, um, in that case, you had the oppression of stating that, but then also allowing slavery, um, which some of the um, the French who helped um, uh, in the Revolutionary War were appalled by when they realized that, uh, I say in passing, but... Um, Um, because Moyne tracks Althusser and Zizek as a believing liberal, as a believing liberal who proposes to use liberalism's best abstract principles as a bulwark, he overlooks uh, the um, the substance of liberalism itself. Um, so I think th this is the problem. It's this attempt to uh, pretend that the whole promulgation of the ideas which were arrived at um, at the end of German idealism and which have played such a role in Kant and um, Gramsci and so on I remember Gramsci's, think, think of the vast disparity of the difference between the way hegemony is used in the ordinary discussion, just used to mean power, basically, and then also propaganda in a certain sense, and the way it's used in Gramsci, where Gramsci says, um, for instance, he says, uh, the North, during the, um, uh, the long period of the unification of Italy, he says Piedmont in the north didn't want uh, hegemony. They didn't want to be a leader in the sense, it, basically in the sense that Plato uh, distinguishes a statesman from a politician who merely wants to be reelected. They were merely like the politician who wants to be reelected. They wanted a source of income. They wanted to keep their power. They didn't want to be seen, snooty lot. Uh, they didn't want to lead. Uh, they weren't egotists like Trump's. Um, uh, they didn't care what people thought of them. They just wanted to dominate. Uh, this we would call today hegemony, but uh, our hegemony. They want, uh, but uh, in Gramsci's sense, they did not want to be hegemons, because in Gramsci's sense, the hegemon is somebody who's um, leading the population, like a statesman in the project, of, in the Socratic project of improving the population in some sense. Um, so just that juxtaposition um, shows um, something like the problem where if scientifically we have a distinction between the good, the true, and the beautiful as the values, and then on the other side, factum are things that happen, things that we can scientifically say um, these are the these are the means. This is how it happens. Uh, you get a different kind of um, analysis of, of of the whole situation than was possible in uh, the time of the founders. They didn't think in 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 those those terms, um, and therefore it's even though Moyne points really only to the time of Roosevelt, it's, we could also say uh, there's this slow fuse delay thing where even though those ideas were known to a few people already in America around 1900 or so, it's such things as the, 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 I know the Potter Stewart, I know it when I see it decision is like 1960s, 64 or something which shows the infusion of a uh, kind of Simmel's fact version of the fact value distinction into the law of the land, into the Supreme Court. So there's even, so we always have to think, uh, even though somebody made a statement like you made this uh, statement and some arguments about the is ought distinction or whatever, um, back in the 18th century, the time for it to come to power to, um, uh, become part of the law is often at a great delay and um, the time for it to permeate even sort of 
uh, every, not just education in um, grade school or in universities, but also to permeate the family life so that when children grow up, they grow into this idea as mother's milk, as Leo Strauss would say, um, should be considered. Um, Okay, so there's uh, much more to be thought through here on the essence of liberalism, but that's some um, attempt to uh, go into the issues.